bottom of that paragraph, she says, I would therefore like to apologise to you on behalf of BBC News. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Simon Jack. Thank you, Deborah Tennes. I know some will say it took too long, but thank you. A fulsome apology from the BBC is not something that happens very often. I'm delighted to get it. But when we go into the detail of this letter, it's really, really interesting. Because, again, she repeats that a senior and trusted source had put this information out. But what was really interesting, and what I learned from this letter was that she says, we went back to the source to check they were happy for us to publish the information. They said that they were. Now, the BBC have apologised. They are now out of it. Which points the finger back to Coots and the NatWest Banking Group. Well, things started to pile up. The great political interrogator Andrew Neil started publishing lists of questions that he felt that uh, the bank had to answer. And Andrew Neil, there is no equivalent to him in Canada. He would be sort of like Peter Mansbridge, but if Peter Mansbridge was universally respected by left and right alike as an interrogative uh, journalist. Andrew Neil, probably the most senior journalist in all of the United Kingdom, started really putting specific questions to the bank, which clammed up. It was incredible to watch the entire journalistic community ask tough questions of the most prestigious bank in the UK and of Alison Rose, who incredibly was making five million pounds a year, even though the bank was 40 percent owned by the government. Now, Alison Rose put out a non-apology apology. Here it is. And she thought this would be enough, but she didn't say the Coots would take Nigel Farage back and she didn't admit to do any doing anything wrong. It wasn't enough. The board of directors had an emergency meeting and they said, we stand by Alison Rose. Alas, she later resigned. Can that board stay the board if they said they had confidence in her? But she obviously broke the banking laws and obviously felt she had to resign. During this whole process, Facebook groups popped up of other people saying they were debanked. Other political candidates said they were debanked. 10,000 people came forward from various banks saying it was happening to them. And soon you started to see members of parliament and even cabinet ministers tweeting their support for Nigel, condemning the bank. How long could that last? And then the prime minister himself, Rishi Sunak, tweeted the same thing. And then just today, the leader of the Labour Party, who must hate Nigel Farage with every fiber of his body, tweeted the same thing, that whatever you think of Nigel Farage, it is wrong to have a political hygiene test for banking. This is the most astonishing thing I've ever seen, and it's not even done yet. I think by the time this is done, the entire board of the bank will be sacked. And it's unthinkable in Canada that a bank CEO quits or is fired or pushed or a bit of that. Now, this is happening in Canada, too, as you might recall. Rebel News applied for a mortgage. We were approved by the Royal Bank of Canada, their Calgary branch. They told me that. But then their national uh, office uh, said that we failed their political hygiene test. Here's my recording of the Calgary uh, mortgage officers telling me that. I knew something was fishy. I knew I had one chance to capture it. Remember this, the Royal Bank, with whom I personally banked for my whole entire adult life, said my credit was fine but they wouldn't give us the mortgage for political reasons. Remember this? Yeah, it's just about the nature of the business altogether because uh, uh, the bank has been, uh, I'll be blunt with you, the bank has been, you know, trying to pry away from certain, you know, uh, clients where they're kind of out there in the media and uh, very strong opinionated, you know, uh, which is your business in a way. So we're just uh, clearing some internal hurdles to make sure that, uh, the bank is okay to back, uh, kind of uh, onboard you as a client internally. Spoiler alert, we do uh, My hands are tied as well. I, I tried defending it. Uh, we went back and forth, but uh, that was their decision. It's been an... So what's the difference? Why is Canada fine with debanking people? Even our government debanked over 200 people during the trucker convoy. Why did the entire British political media establishment stand by Nigel Farage, but in Canada, there's a general shrug. 
not just in my case, but in the 200 people who were debanked because they were trucker convoy supporters. I think there's a few reasons for that. First of all, our banks are few in number, and they're completely colonized by the government, highly regulated, and there's sort of a revolving door between our banks and the government. So I think they're really effectively government agencies. They're highly political. I think cancel culture is really the Canadian way, a passive, aggressive way of silencing people without debating them. I think also um, our media has been undermined and colonized by Justin Trudeau and his substance, whereas in the UK, the British press, especially the newspapers, are still very independent. I think Nigel Farage fighting back against the Coots Bank political blacklist and the fact that other media and other politicians got on board is one of the most significant pushbacks against cancel culture in years.